a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank you, Norma and uh, Shalini and uh, their team that have done this great job in uh, giving us the possibility to speak and uh, share our knowledge about fragile X with all of you. So you have heard from the, from the previous speakers that uh, we are in the era of uh, target treatment and uh, genetic testing and uh, in uh, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, but also we are very much interested uh, as a goal uh, in our research with the development of molecular biomarker that can be uh, used for prediction of these diseases, for prediction of uh, uh, the severity of the penetrance, and also for monitoring uh, the disease, disease progression response to um, treatment. Um, you heard about fragile X syndrome, leading in the cause of intellectual disability, is also the most common monogenic forms of autism spectral disorders. Uh, the prevalence is of one in approximately uh, every 5,000 males, uh, um, less common in females. The premutations uh, prevalence is uh, um, one about 200 in female, one about 400 males, but vary between different populations uh, depending also on ethnicity. It is a behavioral uh, a syndrome, a lot of uh, different clinical uh, symptoms can be seen, um, anxiety disorder, perseveration, aggression, instabilities, um, and also there is a delay in uh, both the receptive and uh, expressive language. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, a clinocleotide repeat disorder. That means that there is a, a repeat, uh, which is CGG, that lies uh, within the uh, five prime of the FMR1 gene. The FMR1 gene is located on chromosome X, on the tip of the, the chromosome. It contains about 17 exons, uh, span about 34 kb of genomic DNA, and uh, undergoes to uh, extensive alternative splicing, just like many housekeeping genes. Um, here you can see that we have a different categories, uh, uh, allele categories, they're, they're changed depending on the number of uh, repeats. Um, so if you have less than 45 repeats, um, we consider a normal allele, you make a normal amount of RNA, a normal amount of FMRT, and so your um, phenotype is uh, uh, normal. Um, in the pre-mutation range, uh, which is characterized by a CGG repeat between uh, uh, 55 and 200, what happens is you have an increased expression of an FMR1 message. So there is an increased um, transcription rate, uh, and that leads to elevated message, elevated message level uh, that trigger RNA toxicity. And so the RNA toxicity is, what, um, is, uh, is one of the mechanisms that is the lead to lead to a number of uh, uh, phenotypes that we call fmr one associated disorders. Um, and uh, um, these are um, disorders for which the individual with the permutation are, are at high risk. And they include, as you heard from uh, uh, Ronnie Hagerman, both Faxtas and Faxboy, but also others, and, uh, uh, and I will show you in the next few slides. If the, DN, the CGGDP number goes over 200, what happens to that triggers a mechanism that leads to um, silencing. So uh, the gene becomes completely methylated, so there is no transcription and there is no translation. And so you, um, there is not a protein encoded from the gene that is called FMRP, so you get fragile X syndrome. And um, the FMRP is it's an important protein because uh, it's an RNA binding protein, so that means that it binds to many other proteins to and uh, regulate the translation. And in fact, here you can see that there are a number of uh, uh, mRNA target uh, that um, are recognized by the FMRP because FMRP has a different uh, binding domain, so it binds to this RNA, it can regulate the translation and it's considered a translational repressor, so in the presence, it regulates if the gene can go on or off. And, uh, and so, by doing that, um, um, FMRP interact with a multitude of proteins that are involved in different cellular functions. And like you can say here, nuclear function, translational, transport, cytoskeletal, remodeling, log and translation, particularly with those proteins that they are 
uh, they have a, a synaptic function. In fact, FMLP is considered very important for synaptic plasticity, uh, memory and learning uh, through uh, this function as a translational repressor. Um, here again, you can see um, some of the um, pathways that uh, are regulated by FMLP, uh, including uh, um, the GABA. Uh, there is a down regulation of the GABA system, there is a, a dysregulation of the dopamine pathway, up regulation of the five. In 2004, uh, it was suggested by uh, Mark Baer uh, group, the uh, m blur 5 theory. And it was postulated that many of the psychiatric and uh, behavioral problems that you see in fragile X are due to an exaggerated response to uh, reason of glutamate in the synaptic. And this uh, leads to um, internalization of the AMPA receptor. And this process is protein synthesis dependent. Now, because FMRP is a translation repressor, in the lack of FMRP, uh, dysregulated this system because there is not FMRP that blocks the translation of this protein anymore. There is not this break. So protein synthesis that, uh, uh, goes on and on, and that leads to um, a, a depletion of the anti receptor of the surface of the synapse, which leads to the immature spine that are seen in both the mouse model but also the humans uh, with fragile X syndrome. Uh, the, spines are very, the spines are very immature, so they are more numerous and elongated, and so they don't get, um, <coughs> they don't get um, uh, the pruning that they need to get uh, more mature. And so that, that leads to weakness of the, the synapses that um, we see in fragile X, but also in autism. Now, we talked about also the premutation. This is what happened in, uh, uh, in, um, in a very simplistic, I would say, in a fragile X. In, in premutation, then, we have uh, a CGG repeat number that, that does not lead or does not trigger methylation, but leads to increase, actually, message expression of the, the gene. And so how do you get all this clinical phenotype? Uh, and there are three, uh, essentially, um, alternative uh, um, mechanisms that are being proposed, which I think they are concurrent because they are not mutually exclusive. And, uh, and there are um, a, one mecha mechanism is called transcription. So when you have the gene that is transcribed, so you get the RNA, in the, in the DNA, the two helix separated, there are um, hybrids that are formed, so there is an hybrid DNA, RNA that is formed, and this happens normally in every cell in all of us. And usually, this structure can lead to a, break, a breakage of the DNA, but then it gets repaired. In some circumstances, this uh, breakage don't get repaired efficiently, and so that can lead to a damage response, and that's what um, has been suggested it also happens in particular in fact stars, but only in the individual with the three mutations. And that is supported by the fact that several of the proteins that are involved in damage response are upregulated. Also, uh, based on the myotonic dystrophy model, uh, the very first model that was proposed for fact stars was uh, the protein sequestration. So there are bind, CGG binding proteins that bind to uh, the CGG stretch. They usually, when it's very long, for the structure that are called the air thin. So this protein binds to the air thin, and, and they get sequestered because now instead we have a normal uh, CGG allele size of, let's say, let's call it 30 CGG. Now you have a longer stretch, 90 repeat, and plus you have more RNA because there is upregulation of the gene, so you have way much more uh, binding capability for this CGG um, binding protein. So they get sequestered, so they don't go and do their function efficiently, that could, could lead to, uh, uh, to the problem that is in pre-mutation. Another post-transcription mechanism is the RAN translation has been uh, um, uh, um, also observed in many other uh, three nuclear I repeat, so the, such that translation of the protein doesn't occur at the ATG site, which is the canonical site for the translation, but upstream. And when that happens, also the CGG gets translated, which normally doesn't occur because the ATG is downstream. So now you have um, 
the formation of a peptide that contains the CGG non in frame, and, uh, and this is the, basically this uh, product here that it contains a polyglycine. And, uh, um, but that after uh, the, the, the CGG, what happens is the, a stop product is created. So you have this short peptide that uh, uh, are believed to be toxic for the cells and they can contribute to the, the pathogenesis of FACSTAS. Now, these three, um, <coughs> three, methodology, three uh, mechanisms, whether they are uh, RNA toxicity with the elevated message level, the RAM translation of the DNA damage response, uh, they probably are those that contribute to um, all the limitation involved that we see across the lifespan, starting from when they are newborn, and you can see many of the character, the physical and the, um, I mean the behavioral and the condition that you can see uh, throughout the lifespan. And those are the facts boy that you will hear about uh, from the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Sherman. Uh, you heard about FACSTAS from uh, Dr. Randy Hagerman. You talked about you heard about uh, depression and anxiety from him. So all across the entire lifespan. Um, but also you have to consider additional genetic factors that can be put in place or secondly hit to somewhere else in the human genome. There can be a point mutation, there can be a copy number variation, it could be environmental control, the use of drugs or alcohol or smoking or um, or, um, as Randy was mentioned, uh, for example, uh, getting close to uh, uh, places with pesticide um, or other <coughs> environmental insults. And also additional uh, medical problems like surgery and uh, the usage of uh, uh, anesthesia. So, so this is what happens. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the, mecha the mechanisms that are proposed for the involvement of the simple carriers. Now, I want to uh, go back a little bit on FMRP because the loss of expression is what caused uh, many of these neuro uh, neurochemical pathways to be disrupted in individual fragilites. As we mentioned, there is an upregulation of the metabotropic uh, glutamate receptor, which is uh, this uh, um, pathway that leads to uh, uh, long term depression, seized in fragilites, fragile there is down regulation of the GABA. But also, um, there is the, for example, the cholinergic uh, pathway, the dopamine, dopamine and cholinergic the pathway that are involved, and the serotonin. And I would like to um, focus particularly on the um, uh, effect of minocycline uh, uh, in fragilex and also the sertraline, which is an SRI, uh, selective uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And I'll show you some uh, um, uh, experience that we have with these two uh, um, medication. So mycocycline is a, an antibiotic, many probably of you know it, and uh, uh, it's, been, uh, um, it's been commonly used for treating uh, acne, vulgaris, and has been found to have a neuroprotective effect. It's been um, uh, observed that if you use minocycline in the mouse model, also in the Drosophila model of Fragilax, so you can rescue some of the, uh, the phenotype, including the uh, uh, the problem that we have with spine, so the spine mat mat maturation is rescued, and also decrease uh, uh, anxiety in, like uh, in the animal model. Um, in this animal model for Fragulex, uh, the um, <laughs> matrix metalloproteins 9, which is an endoprotease, uh, um, the levels are elevated, particularly in the hippocampus, and so, it, and because of the minocycline lower MMP9, um, so it's been postulated that um, that is uh, what probably um, the inhibition of this particular protein it can lead to uh, um, uh, the rescue of this phenotype. And uh, MMP9 is also uh, a protein that has been uh, observed to interact, so it's another FMRP interactor. And uh, is released in the intracellular space uh, in uh, following to uh, glutamate release. So uh, based on this uh, study, the neurobiological study in the mouse and the animal model for Fragilex, but also um, in some uh, open uh, label trial that have been uh, uh, demonstrating benefits in individuals with the Fragilex, uh, uh, particularly in the language of tension and social communication, um, these. Uh, stimulate and prompt 
uh, a placebo controlled crossover trial at the Mind Institute. It was uh, led by uh, Dr. Barry Hagerman, who was, as you can see here, three months uh, on uh, placebo and then uh, three months of, on uh, minocycline or vice versa. Um, so the, basically it was a six month trial uh, on uh, um, children with fragile acts. And there are, these are the batteries of uh, uh, families and the assessments that they were done at the three phases, so at the baseline after three months and after the six months. And uh, Randy probably didn't have enough time to show this, but there was, uh, uh, they observed in, 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 an improvement in behavior, in, uh, in behavior, particularly here when you look at the uh, at the CGI, um, in the much much more improved and the slightly improved in those that were treated with myocytically compared to placebo, though uh, uh, quite a bit of a uh, high placebo effect was noted. And uh, when we looked at the uh, level of MMP9, we found that MMP9 was elevated in fragile X compared to the control. And in, in a few cases was rescued, but uh, by the use of minocycline, and then it went up in, uh, in these two patients uh, after the three months with the placebo. Um, and uh, also, um, what was noticed that there was an improvement uh, in an ERT. Uh, so there was, a, a, a Randy mentioned there is a lack of habituation to sensory stimuli in fragile X. So these were improved in those uh, are treated with minocycline, but not in those with placebo. So, um, so the question is, can we use this as a biomarker? Um, and indeed, I, uh, ERP is, it is included in the current and the future clinical trial as an a, a clinical outcome measures. The other um, uh, study that we, uh, we did was using uh, sertraline. Now, um, sertraline fragile X has been, uh, has been used and be, uh, before and has been demonstrated to have a, uh, an effect, particularly on anxiety and improved language and uh, um, speech. And also, there have been some retrospective studies that in humans that have uh, um, demonstrated uh, uh, improvement in expressive or receptive language in those that were treated with sertraline compared to the ones that were not treated. Um, so, uh, again, uh, this trial was, took place at the, um, at the Mind Institute and was uh, a six month trial uh, where uh, in young children with fragile X so from a two to six years old, uh, and so they were, the children were either on placebo or on, uh, um, on medication. And, uh, and so the idea was to evaluate the benefit uh, of sertraline uh, for treatment. Uh, of early developmental delay, including language delay, in, uh, um, and, and using uh, those measures, CGI, and also looking at the reduction of, of potential reduction of uh, autistic symptoms. And so, what we did, we also um, examined the variation in those genes that are known to be regulating or associated with the serotonin at the synapses. And see, you can see here, and, and the question was. Uh, could we establish potential biomarkers uh, in fragile X? So why do we want to do, why do we want to establish or develop a biomarker? Um, so the biomarker needs to be measurable, uh, so there needs to be a... Two minutes, please. Yes, yeah, so with uh, uh, particular conditions. And, uh, but also we wanted to use uh, for predicting uh, in particular, in clinical trial, who are the responders? And some of the people, some of the children that they are um, in a clinical trial, they respond very well to the medication, but some are not responding. So, can we develop those molecular biomarkers and be predictive of efficacy of uh, uh, target treatment? And so, we use, uh, we analyze 51 individuals, tw uh, half and half were on um, medication and placebo, there were primary outcome measures, secondary outcome measures that were um, analyzed. Um, these are the number of individuals, just the demographic. The, uh, the, we had about 60% that had autism spectrum disorders, uh, half were mosaics, and half were aggregated for mutations. And we looked at the allelic variation. So these are the genes and the allelic uh, variation, the genotype, the frequency. And I'm just going to give you two examples. And we found, that, for example, that there was a significant improvement from baseline. Uh, to after treatment in the Mullen cognitive score only in those in the active arm with the BDNF 
Valmet or Mehmet genotype, but not on those on the active have the other genotype. And there was no difference in those who they were on placebo. Um, and also here there were other genes that were associated with the differential effect uh, of sertraline uh, when we looked at the CGI. And that's, these were the cytochrome P450 and the monamine oxidase and the um, and, and, and this one was the BDNF. So uh, basically what we're trying to do, we're trying to develop uh, uh, or to find some of the allelic variants of the gene uh, that can act as a biomarker. So when we do a clinical trial and we want to determine who uh, is going to respond, that we have a better idea. And just when Suma was uh, talking about personalized medicine, medicine, so everybody is a genetic makeup, and so can we um, unravel our genetic makeup for the, depending on the drug that we use in, in, in order to, depend, to, um, uh, to predict who is going to respond and who is not going to respond. And this, probably this drug, because there's so much commonality with autism spectral disorders, so will probably be helpful also uh, in other neurodimensional disorders. In fact, for example, in uh, in autism, uh, um, all the screening that have been done uh, in autism have found, and this is by um, sequencing, next generation sequencing, probably number variations, have been found that many of the genes that are um, involved in autism are fMRP interruptors. So they are those genes, and particular those synaptic proteins, that uh, interact with fMRP. And just last slide, I just want to mention that when uh, we think about biomarker, we have to think about across uh, uh, different uh, uh, approach, which is not just uh, uh, the genomic, but can be metabolomic, proteomic, uh, epigenetic, in order to uh, create a, a multi-biomarker panel that, um, that contain biomarkers that are involved in all of these uh, uh, levels, and the combination of these biomarkers might help us uh, to uh, monitor disease progression, uh, efficacy for clinical trial, and the severity and the penetrance and also the, uh, the presence of disease or not. So I'm just going to stop here and thank you all the collaborators. Thank you very much.